All right, this is a tray liner here. So this is the, the bottom part or the back part of the CD jewel case. And then this is the part that's down in the bottom. And so with these, you wanna gently flatten this out a little bit so that at least when you put weight on top of it, it'll have a tendency to push down instead of, you don't want it to fold back over. So make sure it's go down. Don't push it too hard because you don't wanna wear out the, uh, the serrations that are here in the paper. So lay it down. Uh, make sure it's nice and flat. I have a ruler here to uh, kind of push the image out into the scan area, but then also still give me a nice uh, straight edge to put it up against. And then what I do is I put a piece of paper over it to act as the back. Um, because you don't want to use the uh, you don't want to use the lid, you know this this thing over here. You don't want to close that because it won't push down on this really well. And the key to getting a good scan is to have it completely flat against the glass. Now this is a Epson Perfection V six hundred. This is a CCD element, the scanning element. And so it's a lot more uh, forgiving on the images on the when the medium isn't flat against the glass. But if you have like a like an all-in-one scanner or a document scanner that uses a CIS element, those are very sensitive to the medium, you know, the whatever you're scanning not being completely flat. So for those, this next part will be very important. Um, so I put the background on there. So you have the white background. Uh, I have a black piece of paper as well in case, um, in case I'm trying to scan a black image. So here's this black card stock. That way you don't get any bleed through on the image. Uh, particularly on the edges um, where the white paper might reflect white the light back onto the artwork. So, and then here, these are my weights. This is just a, a, like a canning jar, and then I glued it to the plastic. And so what I do is just place it on top there. I got another one. And so there we go. That's nice and flat on the glass surface. And then I'll go to the computer and scan it in. This is Epson Scan, and this is the default program for using an Epson scanner. Uh, these are the settings that I use. The, the top ones here, reflective, and then 24-bit and 1200 DPI. 1200 DPI isn't what you'll want to save the eventual, you know, the, the final file as. You'll, you'll want to do 600, uh, but we use 1200 right now because it makes the processing of the image better quality. So we start with, you know, more data, and then once we get it all fixed up the way we like it, then we can reduce it down to the the final amount of data that we use for archiving it. Uh, all these options down here, you don't need to worry about these. Um, what I do is I go to configuration and then cl click this no color correction. And what that will do when you enable that, that grays out all of this stuff. So none of this stuff is even available. So I can't, uh, I can't turn any of it on. But you really don't need any of this, um, at, at least for me with the uh, the V600, the CCD type. It's a really good scanner. It gives you a really good base image. 
And so everything else, uh, as far as the de-screening and the color correction, I fix all of that later on in the software, in the photo editing software. Uh, so here I'll hit scan and it'll kind of see how long this takes. And then for here, uh, for some reason, uh, Epson does not allow PNG on Windows. If, if you're using the software on Apple, on Mac OS, it does allow PNG. So you'll either need to go with bitmap or TIFF. Don't use JPEG because that can affect the uh, de-screening process. We don't want any compression. We just want uh, lossless pixel saving. So I do uh, TIFF and then uh, OK. Once I have the TIFF file, um, what I'll do is I'll, if it's the first folder or first image of that thing, I'll just make a folder to store them in. And then uh, I like to go through and just do a very rough alignment on them with paint.net since it's very easy. It, aligning things. So I just crop it and then uh, rotate it the way it needs to go. You don't need to do anything here. We'll do that later. So like this de-screening here, you see all these dots. We'll take care of that in something else in a uh, different software, but paint.net is just very good at uh, quickly modifying an image. Uh, don't resave it or uh, don't resize it. And then here is where I'll do the conversion to get it into PNG. And uh, this is the tray liner. All right. 
right? And then we'll switch over to uh, photo editing software and fix this image up. The software that I use for photo editing is uh, Affinity Photo. Um, it's like Photoshop, but what I like about it is that you can you can just pay a one-time price and then that's it. You don't have to pay the monthly fee. And so even at full price, it's 50 bucks, but they very often will do 50% off uh, discounts. So then it's $25 and that's it. That's all you ever have to pay. And then for the de-screening, which is really the, the big secret here to making good scans, I use this Satva D-Screen plugin, and it's meant for Adobe Photoshop, but Affinity Photo can also use Adobe Photoshop plugins. And so what it does is it, when you zoom in really close, you see these dots on the scanned document, and what it does is it gets rid of them and smooths them out, but does it in a much better way than what uh, like a Gaussian blur would do. That's probably what most people do that don't want to spend money. They just use a Gaussian blur and it looks okay, but it it's blurry, it's soft. Whereas this D-Screen plugin will look a lot sharper. And if you get this plugin, um, you need to make sure that this file is in your affinity uh, folder. It, this file is included in the download for the Satva D screen, but if you get an error, you, you don't have to put it at first, but if you get an error that says something like it couldn't find the DLL for D screen, it, it's actually this DLL that's causing the problem, not, not the path for the, for the D screen plugin itself. All right, so I'm gonna load up this picture. We're gonna open it with Affinity Photo. And then part of the reason that I did the pre-processing in photo.net or paint.net is because when you try to use the D screen and you try to make changes and all that, it uses the original version of the photo, not what you've edited it to. So when you do the cropping and the rotating and all that stuff, it'll still be whatever the original format of the image was when you opened it here on uh, the Affinity Photo. So by kind of getting it all roughly the orientation and the shape that it needs to be in paint.net, when you open it here, it's a little easier to deal with. So let's say we can, if you zoom in, you'll see you got these dots everywhere. You know, this, this line is actually made up of a bunch of dots that are spaced out and how big they are and all that. And then when you zoom out, it makes a nice even image. So to use this filter, um, first you'll have to make sure that your filters are, your plugins are working. And you go to preferences and then click this Photoshop plugin. And it's gonna have a, they'll show up down here. If It'll try to detect it either in this folder and you can click this button to open that folder and then just paste the DLL files, it's like the DLL and the 8BL file, whatever's in the program. Let's see here. So yeah, these these ones. And then make sure when you do the plugin files that you grab the right one. You're, you're probably going to want to get this D screen home version, 64-bit, and then put those files just uh, you can put a folder here or you can just put the files straight up inside this folder. It'll find it either way, but it might be easier to organize it this way. 
And then you can also set another folder and it'll just look in any of them. And then they'll show up down here, but because they're Photoshop plugins, they'll say this unknown. And then what you need to do is click this button that says allow unknown plugins to be used. And then they'll be enabled and you'll have to restart Affinity Photo to, to make this take effect. And then once you have the image loaded here, it's under filters and then plug in sat the D screen. And what's going to happen is it's going to scan this image and start looking for the dot patterns. And um, the automatic will be set. And then if, if it happens to be somewhere where it can't find any, what you can do is you can just move this around until you find a good area with dots. So if you had like a part of the album the cover that was just like really clean like white uh, sometimes it'll fail i don't know maybe if i go up here you know like here it might fail and it says it found it but okay this is the error you'll get it says the screen was not found and it just wants you to move to somewhere that has dots and then what you can do is you can either click these buttons manually or you can just cycle the automatic again. And then if the automatic doesn't work, you can turn it off and you can go up here and you can use the arrow keys and just kind of mess around with it. Um, first, you'll need to set the angle because sometimes it'll be set to zero or off and then these things won't work correctly. And so you just set it to something. Uh, and then this, the, the, uh, the screens and the lines per inch are really, this is the one that really makes a difference. And you can see how you can just kind of move it around and it changes the way that the effect looks. But again, the automatic works like now 85% of the time or it'll at least get you in the ballpark. And then once it's good to go, you hit OK. And it takes a couple minutes here. Um, it doesn't seem to be affected by cores or anything. I mean, it, it's barely doing anything. So see here, I mean, it's there's no utilization going on. It's not doing anything. But uh, while it's doing this, the it'll become non-responsive, and it's it runs for a couple minutes to do this. So it, what I'm trying to say is, it doesn't matter. Like if you have some super fast PC, if it's on, if the image is on a solid state drive or anything it just it just takes time and this is why you want to do it at 1200 dpi because it gave it a lot more information to work with as you get down to 600 DPI, it's not quite as good. And then I think three, if you do it at 300 or so, it, it won't even work because the dots just don't have enough resolution to them. You got to do it at 1200 DPI so that the dots are very well defined and it can calculate on the spacing. Okay, so you saw that it, it finally changed. And now you see how this is all very smooth looking there's no dots anymore everything is nice and clean and then from here once you got that you can crop it in uh, use the crop tool up here and just kind of bring it in if it's not like angled particularly well 
you can rotate it within that outline before you hit apply. All right, and so we'll hit apply. All right, so now it's cropped. And then go in and try to clean up stuff if you want. Um, there is a healing brush, but I usually use the clone stamp. If you hit the Alt key and then just make sure you keep using a good source. So if you if you're moving, so you might have you're gonna have to constantly be realigning your target. And then like something like that. I don't know. It's hard to tell if it's supposed to be there. Probably not. It's kind of a weird discoloration there. There's another one right here. And then clean up the edges. And then some of the stuff is discoloration, like around here. That'll get cleaned up if we apply uh, levels. We'll jack up the lighting a little bit. See, that got rid of all that discoloration and then pull the darks in a little bit more. So I have something like this. You can add a preset um, and you could just call it whatever. I, I have one called general, but if you call it scans, and then, so if I remove this, uh, delete, and I go over to adjustments here, and then click levels, see there's one called scans now. And then you just click apply, and it's it already saved all the stuff that you had typed in. All right. Now, some of this stuff, like this discoloration here, you could go in and fix some of this. Um, let's see here, I'll show you this. This is a trick here. If you wanted to make this like more solid, use the uh, flood select and make sure you're on the right layer. Um, Click on the background. Oh, sometimes it's a good idea to, once you have this level set, just merge it down. And so now the image is hard set the way it was. And because sometimes you can fight yourself when you're dealing with those active, <coughs> active filters. Uh, I'll say flood select and I'll select it. And then you go up here and you click add and you can Keep adding if you want to get rid of like here just accidentally grabbed that I click the rectangular you can also do this um, selection brush and make sure you click subtract uh, that's because I had snap to edge on it it kind of predicted out and it filled out the rest of the selection that was similar colors so there, um, so I'll go back, make sure it's set to add. See, this is going to get, yeah, it picked up a lot of that. So in this case, the flood select, you can try, you can try turning this down a bit, but because it's grayscale, these are very similar colors. 
just undoing. See, that's that's kind of the problem you run into. It's like too much. Okay, that that one's pretty good. Here, I'll use the uh, add. And then subtract. A lot of this is very manual. So add, add. Okay, so I got the the big letters here. I'm just gonna. You can also hit the, um, let's see, is it the add or alt key? Yeah, the alt key will do the opposite of whatever your mode is. So here I have subtract, but by holding alt, it does the opposite of that. So that's a way to be quick. So you're not constantly messing around with the menus. So I took release the alt key and now it's back to subtract. Um, and then of course you can do the, the marquee tool. So I have subtract. So that way if you want to get like a nice straight line. And then another key that is good to know is to change the size of this circle, you can hit the bracket keys and it grows pretty nicely. And then that way you're not up here like guessing what these are. You can just hit this key and it'll change it on the fly for you. All right. So now you've got this big area selected. Go to select and then shrink. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull this in just a little bit. Okay, and see what it did was it, it shrunk it so that it's not quite on the edge of the color separation anymore. And then there was a pixel here that we didn't see. So we'll uh, add that. And then I'm going to sample and change the point to 65 by 65. Click here and see it got the gray now. So I'll add a layer, make sure that gray is selected, and then fill. And now I've filled that whole area with a solid color. And then what I like to do is uh, click this FX button and do a Gaussian blur to about one pixel. When you're at 1200 DPI, about one pixel is good. And there we go. Now we got like a very smooth solid color here on this big open space. And then if you turn it off, you see how it cleans it up pretty well. And then you could go through and do the same down here. It did take a lot of work though. Uh, I guess one quick thing that you could do is if you were to uh, select your background and then set this guy and where it starts to get really bad. Oh yeah, see the, the line change there. So we can't do that. You see this, this uh, where the perforation is, it got a lot thicker than right here. So for this kind of stuff, um, you'd probably want to go back to this and uh, if you want to make it like smooth looking, make the circle a little big and change the hardness down to a low like 20. And what it'll do is it'll add a fade. And then it will make the uh, change a little more believable looking.
And this blue color is just caused by the, the, the bend in the paper as the light reflects it because the silver is kind of reflective. And so it changes the texture of the surface or the angle of it. And so that's why that light, it hits it differently and causes some problems. Get rid of that. Uh, whenever you're doing these stamps, you want to make sure you want to watch out for patterns, repeating patterns. So here, I copied this thing and I put it down here. Sometimes you can just randomly click different areas and you'll get rid of those repeating patterns. All right. So now if we zoom out, you see, now that blue tone is gone and then I'll use the bracket keys and shrink that down and then just come in here, this tight area. Okay. All right, so now if we think that this is presentable and this is the final product, we can go up to document, resize document, and there's a couple different ways that you can change numbers here. Um, in Affinity, we're gonna go to 600 DPI, and you'll see it automatically changed it to half. So each number got reduced in half. The other way you can do this is you can, um, what is it, 50%? And as long as this is locked, they'll both, when I hit tab, they both uh, change to 50% because they're locked. But the DPI is still set at 1200, so I usually just do the DPI method. Okay, resize. So now it's shrunken down, and you see now like this kind of stuff in here this is a very clean, clean look in here. And then this is all very clean looking. And so now when you archive this, it'll look a lot better. I mean, you can spend more time cleaning this up if you want. All right, and then to set it, save it, file, export. Don't do save as. That saves it as a uh, proprietary file format. If you just want PNG or JPEG, go to export and then PNG. All right, and then you can overwrite it. Here's the original file and we'll overwrite it. Say yes. And there we go.